Good morning, Christ Hold Fast friends. My name is Bruce Hillman. I'm pastor at uh, Hillside Lutheran Brethren Church in northern New Jersey and a contributor here at Christ Hold Fast. And today is Thursday, and we are finally finishing the book of Ecclesiastes, and so we're going to be in all of chapter 12 today. And instead of uh, reading it like I normally do and then going through it, we're just going to read through it together and comment on it because it's a little bit of a unique passage this morning. Uh, so, let's just recap quickly here. Uh, Ecclesiastes in chapter 1 and 2 began with ex an account of creation, about planets spinning around and everything else and how humans enter uh, like this drama of creation. It's like we enter from one side of the stage to the other and we run off and we're, we're done. Um, and he says life is vanity because humans are trying to gain, but fundamentally they don't change anything. The sun still comes up in the morning. Uh, the things still happen like they used to. We don't make a lasting difference. That was how he opened the book, with creation and this idea of vanity. And now he's going to close the book with the idea of death and vanity. Uh, so you can see, we start in creation and we end at death. Now there's a reason for this, and it's an important reason, and it's the last point that he wants to make for us today. But he wants to have a very, very graphic picture of getting old and death itself. Maybe one of the more uh, graphic things in all ancient literature about growing old and things like that. Um, okay, so he says, starting in verse 1, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Um, obviously, if you're in the ancient world, getting old is a lot worse than it even is now. It's not fun now, but it's really not fun in the ancient world when technology and medicines and things like that haven't uh, helped people uh, to the extent that they can now. So Koheleth has a very negative view on being old. It's something that is uh, priming you for death. The, the, the breakdown of the body and the hardships of life are, is the lengthening shadow of death coming reminding you of the vanity of life, reminding you that as much difference as you tried to make, it was going to, uh, death is going to be the final judge on all of what we do. Now, there's a lot of debate over, you're going to see a lot of images, a lot of strange language in the most of this chapter. And scholars have debated literally for centuries what some of these things mean. Some of them we are very confident we know what they mean. Those tend to be the ones that are done earlier in the passage. And as you get further through the passage, they seem to become less clear what exactly Koheleth means by these analogies and these metaphors and these turns of phrases. The overall point is, he'll make at the end is very clear. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to give you uh, what are the relatively safe interpretations of these. There's some debate on all of them, but these are the relatively safe ones. And then I'll tell you the ones that we kind of really don't know at all what they mean. So let's go through it and we'll see the points that he makes. Again, starting from the beginning, going towards the end, we have a better sense of what he means as he keeps using the metaphors, less so. Okay, so we'll start with the end of one and into two. When the evil days come and the years draw near of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. Verse two, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return uh, with the rain. This whole section's apocalyptic. It's about the the end of all things. Not necessarily like the apocalypse, John's apocalypse in, in Revelation. He's not doing that. But he's just kind of, he's looking towards the end of life, the end of all things. And he's using these graphic metaphors to, to help us understand that. So, what does he mean by before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain? It, as we get older, uh, it's kind of like as the day goes by and it gets, you know, you have noon and then as the day goes by it gets darker and darker and darker and darker. That's what he's saying here. Uh, as our lives age, death comes for us and the shadow of death lengthens. And we start to realize at some point that we have less years in front of us than we do behind us. And that can cause an existential crisis. It can cause all sorts of problems. And then he says, verse 3, In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed. All right. Uh, what does he mean by the, when the keepers of the house tremble? One of two things is predominant. Either when the servants who are younger, 
tremble because you're old and you might fall and get hurt and then they would be responsible. They're the keepers of the house. Or it could be that the keepers of the house are, is simply the potafamilias, the, the guy who the whole family depended on, um, but now he's getting old uh, and he trembles. When the strong men are bent, it's pretty obvious, uh, men used to be strong in their youth, and now when they're getting older, they're just, they're just a shadow of what they used to be. The aging process is hard on our bodies. And the grinders cease because they are few. The grinders, uh, some people think this means teeth, but in this case it probably doesn't mean teeth because of the context. The strong men are men who were young and now are old. The grinders were the women who in this time period would grind in the, the, the corn in the mill, uh, the wheat, um, at the mill. And so the strong men are bent and the women uh, cease to do their grinding work, their milling work, because they're few. They're also dying off. Um, and those who look through the windows are dimmed. Uh, one of two things this might be. Either uh, you're old and you can't go out anymore and you're stuck in the house and everything is happening outside. It's happening outside the windows. You're not able to participate in life anymore. Or it could mean that there are people looking in on you um, with pity because your end draws nigh. Uh, of course, this is all wonderfully pessimistic stuff. All right, verse 4. And the doors on the street are shut. Now we're getting into commerce. So the doors on the street are shut. Uh, the doors of the marketplace. You used to have, be someone who could work. You used to be someone who made a living. You, you, you used to be someone who got up in the morning and had something to do. But now the doors are shut. You're not able to work anymore. Your body just won't let you. Or uh, the work has been given to younger people. And the sound of the grinding is low. Uh, the women don't get to work either, even in the mills. Uh, and one rises up at the sound of a bird. Well, old people don't sleep well. They rise up early. And all the daughters of song are brought low. Most likely, the beauty fades. The, the, the singing of youth has been brought low. It is just a hum now. Verse 5. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. Um, of course, when you're old, you can fall. And you know now when people fall and break their hip, if they're very old, that's usually a very bad sign, even with all our modern technology. So you can imagine uh, what that would be like in the ancient world, basically, if you fell, it was a death sentence. Now, here's some fun ones. And he says, and then the, uh, uh, he says, when they're afraid of, when, of high and of terrors on the way, the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails. Um, almond tree is a, we're not sure of it's one of maybe two things one it could be the blooming of gray hair that's what some commentators think just like a flower blooms uh, hair blooms into gray hair although more likely what I think it means some other scholars think is the blooming is when on the almond tree when the flower blooms what's the next stage it dies it falls off um, and it plants a seed for the future but it's, it's done so, most likely he's talking about you're in the last stage of your life. The almond tree blossoms. Here's the R-rated Ecclesiastes. The grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails. Well, what's the grasshopper dragging itself along? Almost certainly because it says and desire fails. Uh, they didn't have Viagra back then. And so the grasshopper dragging itself along means that all sexual desire and potency has been lost in old, old age. Why? Because man is going to his eternal home, and then we get a funeral, and the mourners go about in the streets. So isn't this pleasant for your devotional this morning, all this wonderful stuff to look forward to when you get older? And now we get the last metaphors for the chapter, and these we actually, there's a tremendous amount of debate. We don't really know what these mean. There's one, though, that I think gives key to what the others mean. But here, here it is, verse 6. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel is broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. There have been many attempts to try to figure out what these mean. The silver cord is snapped. Some people say it's your spinal cord. Uh, the golden bowl is broken. Some people say that's your heart. There's really, that's high speculation. We really don't know what these mean. The one that, though, seems to be the best one we can guess at is the wheel broken at the cistern. 
if we we know from Ecclesiastes, a theme of Koheleth's is the idea of the times always coming back around. And God is in charge of the times, and you never know what time you're going to find yourself in. But uh, wherever you find yourself in, God is with you, but you can't gain. You can't. Wisdom will not give you control of the times. So the wheel is most likely the times, and the wheel will now be shattered. He, your time is done. Uh, you will no longer be part of the cycle of life. You will no longer be part of the cycle of the times. And so whatever those other metaphors mean with golden bowls and silver cords, they probably relate to this idea this idea of the times are being broken. Now, this is an important point for everything we've learned in Kohela so far, in Ecclesiastes so far, because this has been a major theme of his, that we are living our lives to gain, to get ahead, because we think around the next corner is happiness, but instead we're to find happiness in the moment. But what do you do when death is, is literally hanging right over you? How are you supposed to find happiness then? In other words, death puts a kind of uh, final curtain on any attempts to try to gain or be happy in life because whatever gains you have will all be lost in death. And that's why he says, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And that ends Kohaleth's thoughts about life and the meaning of life. But we do get a little... Uh, narration at the end, probably from Kohalath's disciples who studied under him. And this is the, the last verses of the book, and we'll just read them all now. It's 9 to 14. And it says, Besides being wise, the preacher, that's Kohalath, also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails, firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil. And there we end it. So let's talk about what these last little narrative verses uh, might mean for us. The whole book is anxious about the question, what is the meaning of my life, in the, in the, in the face of, it, it, with the understanding that uh, gain gets us nothing and that death comes for us in the end. And if we assume those two things, gain gets us nothing and death comes in the end, then what's the point? For Kohaleth, the point is to uh, honor God or to love God and to obey his commandments. Now, Kohaleth doesn't have any knowledge of Jesus Christ, uh, but he does have this sense of, of a great shepherd. Uh, he says the words of the wise are like goads and they are like nails firmly fixed. They are collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. He believes wisdom comes from God and that wisdom is meant to shepherd us, to guide us through life, to help us out. But ultimately, that help that wisdom will give is not a way to get ahead, to get an advantage in life over other people. Instead, the advantage of wisdom is to allow oneself to accept the truth about life. Because by accepting the truth about life, what life is, what reality actually is, one is able to live the best life that one can, to experience the best life that one can. And for Kohaleth, that truth is very simple. It is actually very much a carpe diem type of philosophy. You only have today. You don't even know if you're going to have this afternoon. You don't even know if you're going to have this evening. All you have is right now. And the now that you have, Kohela thinks, is gifted to you. It's graced to you. And so each moment that you're experiencing is a moment of giftedness and grace from God. You have life. And Kohela says death will come for you one day. And, in, and because you know that, because you know it will come for you one day, that all the more makes the giftedness of the now graced. Because it means that God has a purpose and a plan for you, and that you have an opportunity to give praise and worship to God for whatever God has given you right now. Maybe you're having a hard time with life. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're overwhelmed. Maybe you're anxious. Maybe you have a lot of what-ifs and why questions swirling about. 
And Koheleth wants to say, but those are all questions that deal with fear of loss and therefore gain. And you have to push those questions away and learn to live in the moment but not for the moment. You need to learn to look at the life that you have now as something that God has given you in this moment. And that, what that means is uh, giving praise to God because... Uh, God has given me my health, he's given me my family, he's given me my job, he's given me uh, the books that I like to read, uh, he's given me my dog Winston, who's right here at my feet right now. He's given me all these great and wonderful things that I can give thanks for right now. And happiness and joy is to be found in accepting our lot, in accepting what God has given us, whether that is a good season or a bad season, or whether we have everything we want or not. And and this carpe diemness. I think actually also points us to Christ. Now, Koheleth can't go here because he doesn't know about Christ, but we can. The Good Shepherd is not someone who just leaves us to the times, but enters into our times with us. He gives us great and precious promises to live by, and he promises to be with us always until uh, the end of the age. And he is the God who, um, who walks with us and, and, and who died for us and who gives us hope uh, and our future relationship with God, because Koheleth doesn't know uh, whether he has a future or not in the afterlife, but we do. And so all the more we have ways to be thankful. We don't have to fear death like Koheleth does. A uh, Death for us is simply a doorway into new life because of what Jesus Christ has done. So that is the book of Ecclesiastes. For those of you who have been with it since the beginning, I, I thank you. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the book as much as uh, I have over the years. And um, what we're going to do next is, since I go on vacation in a couple weeks, I'm going to spend the next few weeks just doing random, some random devotionals. And then we're going to go into either one of two books, and you can comment on which you'd prefer. These were the, when I threw out the requests, these were the two winners, um, and we'll probably end up doing both at some point. But whichever one you want to see first, let me know. That would either be uh, James or Nehemiah. So if you want to make a comment on that in the next week or two, uh, I'll announce which one we'll do when I get back from vacation. So thank you for watching. I hope you check out the other presenters that we have here on Christ Hold Fast. And I ha hope you have a wonderful day living in the moment, but not for the moment, and experiencing the graced giftedness that God has given you today. Have a wonderful day. Bye.